I had the chance recently to sit down with Father Mike Schmitz, the author of How to Make Great Decisions. Our conversation covered everything from how much coffee he drinks and who his favorite superhero is, to his work with young people, his life as a priest, his insights into prayer and relationships, and his favorite material possession. Now I'm delighted to share our conversation with you. It is my hope that it will help you get to know him like never before. So Father Mike, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're super grateful and excited to have this time with you. Um, I have a very serious question to get started, and that is, um, who is your favorite superhero and why? <laughs> yes, um, I think that's a great question, but it actually is a, it's not a softball. It is just a challenging question. So um, I'm kind of a DC guy. There's Marvel, of course, there's DC. Um, one has made really successful movies. The other has made really incredible um, comics. So it comes down to Superman and Batman, kind of the big two. And if I had to, uh, I don't know that I could actually ever choose. If I had to go Marvel, that's easy. Captain America all the way. That's just very, very clear. Um, but one of the things Marvel does with their with their characters is they always want to give them some really clear flaws, which is not horrible. It's just not why, why I would want to read comic books. I want to read comic books to get into that world. I don't necessarily need the, the heroes. I like the heroes to, uh, to have a purpose and be driven by that purpose um, more than anything else. Fantastic. So we um, we asked uh, on social media this morning, we asked people to submit questions. And also another very serious question from the audience is, how much coffee do you drink? <laughs> That's funny, because I right next to me have my, my coffee <laughs> mug. I only had, I would say, half of a cup today so far. And half the, and half the day's through. So um, I can go anywhere from a couple pots. So it's interesting because um, if I'm at my parents' place, my family's house, uh, and they're just hanging out, and there's someone keeps making coffee, I will keep drinking coffee. If I'm at a conference and they keep having coffee there, I'll just keep sipping on it, not because I need it, but just because it's one of those things like, oh, you might as well drink on something, sip on something warm. Um, but I can go for, from one cup to uh, maybe two pots in any given day. I've kind of a spread. Fantastic. What about favorite sport? And is there a lesson you draw from that sport about life? Oh gosh, yeah. So I I would say um, recently, but even in the last four years, I never watched sports ever. Um, I like the Olympics, love the Olympics, um, because the Olympics were the only place that I could get the sports I was that I participated in. Um, I never understood the idea of watching someone else do a thump, something you like doing yourself. Like so, I never. If you play basketball, it'd be like, well, just go play basketball. Don't watch people play basketball. Um, but the but. The Olympics, I can understand. I, I like, I ran, I swam, um, triathlon, cross country skiing. Those were kind of my jam, which are not necessarily broadcast very often, except for every four years um, on TV. Um, but within the last four years, I got into CrossFit and in competing in CrossFit a little bit, and um, not anything big, just kind of small stuff. And I find myself wanting to watch all of the time other people do this because. Uh, and I kind of get what it is to be a fan now, to be able to watch and see how someone does something so excellently. It's just, it blows my mind. So that's one thing I think kind of a takeaway is from, from sports is, is this pursuit of excellence and this decision to, I, I, can, I can choose to be great. Um, the other piece that I love about sports, it's one of the reasons I think everyone should be in sports or in music or in theater or anywhere you can fail is that hopefully sports teach you how to fail. And I think that's probably one of the best lessons that anyone could possibly learn is how to fail. And uh, I think it's one of the best lessons that, that sports offer to uh, young people. That's a, that's a fantastic insight. Um, you know, I think, I think it's, as a parent, it's hard to let your children fail. Oh yeah. And, and it's, it's so important, you know. Um, we talk here a lot about the idea that, you know, parents' role isn't to prepare the road for their child but to prepare their child for the road. Right. And there is failure on the road. So that's a fantastic insight. What about, um, you know, you've touched a lot of people and, um, and so they're naturally curious about you. Tell us a little bit about like growing up. What, what, was, what was Father Mike like growing up and what was growing up like for Father Mike? Yeah, I, um, I would say that if you can sum it up in one word, I would say I was a punk, but it probably wasn't that much of a punk. Um, 
kind of a, so I would say this, I grew up, I was raised in a, a Catholic family. So I had my mom and dad who both are Catholic and, and brought us all to church. I'm one of six kids, um, three boys and three girls. And um, yeah, so when it came to faith, uh, there was the rule that we have to go to mass every single Sunday. And I would say that um, the only reason my parents said, the only reason, only way you could get out of going to Sunday mass was if you're too sick to do anything for the rest of the day, um, too sick to do anything else. And so there were times when I did disliked going to mass so much that I would pretend to be sick get out of one hour of mass, but then have to sit in my room the entire rest of the day. This is, you know, before devices, before phones, before computers, before TVs in rooms, like it, it basically being in your room by yourself meant sitting on your bed, doing nothing. And for whatever reason, I thought that was a good trade-off. Like I disliked going to mass so much that I thought that's not bad. I got one hour free. Now I have the rest of the day in captivity, but at least I didn't have to go to church. And all of that changed. Um, I remember I actually even had a, uh, must've been, gosh, fifth, sixth grade, somewhere in there, um, where one of our teachers, she was a substitute, substitute teacher, and she was playing Christian music at some point. And I was at a Catholic school and she, she said, I said, oh, is this one of those, I, she played Christian music and I said, are you one of those Jesus freaks? And I, I have no idea why, where, where, where did I ever hear that phrase? And my parents didn't talk like that. Where would I even say this? And she's like, what are you talking about? I was like, this sounds like one of those Jesus freak songs. And uh, she says, yes, I am. And you know what? One day you are going to be too. And I was like, no way. And she says, wait a second. Jesus is going to get a hold of you. And when he does, you just better watch out. And I was like, whatever. And then when I was about 15 or 16, I had this big moment of conversion and um, where Jesus got a hold of me. And it started, um, it was pretty private, pretty personal. Um, wasn't in a group, wasn't through any like big, no, no one gave a talk, I didn't read a book. What happened was um, I just had this personal awareness at one point of my own sin. I mean, that, that was what it was. It was, I'd heard what the, all the sins were for, you know, my whole year, my whole life growing up. And those were all, yep, yeah, I know what they are. They're on the list, they're on the tablets. Um, but all of a sudden there was this awareness that, oh my gosh, that's what I do. Like sin is something that that's in me now. And I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, like I, I, I can't just, I can't just forgive myself. I can't just save myself. I need a savior. And it was like one of those thing, like, oh my goodness, that's what they've been telling me my entire life is that Jesus is the savior. And I realized, oh my gosh, now I get what that means. I had been, I had been given the answer before I had the question and I'd been given the lifeline before I knew that I needed it. Mm. And so in that moment, it was so clear. I knew I needed to pray. I knew I needed to go to confession. And so the prayer route started at one point. I can talk about that if you ever want to. But I remember confession, I, I didn't know how, I didn't know you're supposed to wait until Saturday to go. So I knew where the priest lived. And so I got on my bike and I rode across town 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, knocked on the priest door. And I always say, of course he was home because priests only work one day a week. And, uh, and I said, Father, can I go to confession? Sure, come on in. I sat down on the couch and went to confession. And I remember walking out of that rectory, stepping on the front porch, and three thoughts were so clear in my mind. One was just, God, thank you so much. Because um, I had felt the weight of sin to, to a degree. I had felt that. And I just, God, thank you so much. For, you've completely forgiven me of all of my sins. My second thought was, God, if you ever want me to be a priest, I will hear anyone's confession anytime they ask. Mm. And I never thought about being a priest before. I mean, maybe when I was really, really little, but never entertained it seriously. But that was the first time I ever just, God, if you want. So the first two thoughts, one, God, thank you so much. Uh, second, if you ever want me, to be, want me to be a priest, I will hear anyone's confession whenever they ask. My third thought was, oh, she's really cute. Like, <laughs> so that started this, this uh, battle of like, gosh, what do you want me to do, Lord? And, but then, you know, I, I did read some books and did encounter uh, the truth of Jesus in the Eucharist in a way that just blew me away. I encountered the reality of uh, the pr life of prayer that we're meant to be called into um, that just can transform my life. But it all started, um, like Pope Benedict said in God is Love, where he says, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty ideal. It's the result of an encounter with a person that gives one's life a uh, sets it, it gives one's life a new horizon and sets it in a decisive direction. And I can trace so much back to stepping on that front porch and realizing, okay, Lord, from that moment, you gave me, gave my life a new horizon and you set me in a decisive direction. And that was, that was, I was kind of, that was pretty big. Of course, I had all the same things. I was still in sports and still loved uh, high school. I, I was one of the weird people who liked high school, um, but uh, that's a whole nother story. That's fantastic. So would you say, you know, that moment on the porch, uh, is that the moment where the faith 
became your faith or is there another moment that you define in that way? Yeah, that, that was that was a big moment. It's, it's, it's all part of that same process. It was started with this awareness of sin. It started with, it continued and it really the encounter of Jesus in confession, just really knowing his love. So it, very similar, uh, but it was all part of the, the oh my gosh, I need him. Um, oh, he's been given to me. And then there was uh, two other pieces. One is learning how to pray. And the other was learning about Jesus in the Eucharist. Mm. And all of those things, because learning how to pray wasn't just a one-time thing. And uh, that was a, okay, how do I show up for prayer? And if this is real, I have to do this. If this is real, then I need to spend time with him. I mean, even as a, as a high schooler, it was very, very clear. And then I remember reading in a book about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And <laughs> it's crazy. I, I, I went downstairs and told my siblings, like, you guys, do you know that Jesus really is truly present in the Eucharist? They're like, yeah. Like, no, he's like really <laughs> present. Like, it, they're looking at me like, we've all went to Catholic school too. We know this. I'm like, I don't know if I was sick that day. I don't know if I didn't pay attention. I know I didn't pay attention. Um, but it that, that that changed everything. And just recognizing not only God's love for me personally in confession, through his forgiveness of sins, but also in in the mat in the mass in the eucharist and so everything changed i mean then from then on i never wanted to skip mass again it was just a matter of okay i need to need to be there but yeah the way to say it is is that that is the season where the faith became uh, my faith yeah fantastic so that's you know it's just over 30 years ago since you you stepped on that porch yeah how does jesus continue to amaze you today oh my gosh that is such a great question because um you know, that was, a, that was the beginning in so many ways. I mean, the, the real beginning was baptism, all those. But um, I, I can look back at that moment or that, that season with such great fondness, um, but recognizing that the Lord is here now. And the only, I can look back with gratitude and fondness and, and also I can learn a lot. You know, you know Jesus in the uh, book of Revelation talks about, one of the words for the churches, I think it's the church at Ephesus, is that, you know, you're doing all the right things and, and you believe all the right things and and you're doing okay. But this thing I have against you is you lost your first love. Mm -hmm. And so I can look back at times and that season and say, okay, Lord, how am I doing? Am, 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 I, um, am I really pursuing you with the same abandon as I did at first? Am I still loving you with the same love um, that I did at first? And I mean, by, by same love, I mean uh, with the, that same... Uh, I want you to have my whole heart. You know, I think sometimes we, we settle into uh, just kind of rhythms that are comfortable as opposed to rhythms that really stretch us and say, um, okay, yeah, I, I following you, Lord, costs me something, it costs me my whole heart. And like, well, no, but I've got comfortable things around me. I've got this really nice chair behind me. I've got, you know, comfortable room that I'm in right now, as opposed to saying, Lord, it's all yours. And so um, what I've experienced since then is that that depth of God gets to claim everything else. He gets to claim everything. Um, so I, for initially it was, you get to claim my sins. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, get to take those away from me. But uh, but he has, to, he has to be able to have access to every part of my life. And that's one of the things that, I keep coming back to every single day um, in prayer is that he has to have access to all of it. It's powerful. You know, the, the, the phrase like wholehearted is so common yeah. in our society. I, I've been meditating just on that phrase over the last couple of weeks and meditating. What have I done in my life in a wholehearted way? What am I doing in my life in a wholehearted way now? Um, and it's interesting how we can get to a place of wholeheartedness and then regress from that wholeheartedness, yeah. but still think that we're there. And, and, and that's why it's just so important, I think, to check back in from time to time. You know, you spend a lot of time working with young people, mm -hmm. young adults, um, which is beautiful and, and so needed and necessary. What would you say is young people's greatest need today as you're working with these young people what strikes you as oh this is their greatest need like there's these great moments in the in the gospels where just jesus just surveyed the crowd 
and he recognized some yearning in them, some longing in them, some need in them. As you survey all the young people you're working with today, what is their greatest need? It's a great question because there's so many needs. Obviously, in the last year, we've experienced the need for others, need for community, need for real friendship, um, the need to be able to be together. I mean, just like there's so much isolation. And, uh, you know, as scripture says, Jesus saw the crowd and felt pity on them because they were uh, right and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. I think there's an abandonment that, that, that grips a lot of the young people these days or even a fear of abandonment. They can have, they can have, they can have uh, even intact families that they're coming from, the families of origin, and still have that fear of abandonment. Um, mm. they're so, because relationships are so transitory. Even, um, even in stable families, they see like, well, be up my, my extended family, have, my aunt and uncle walked away from each other or whatever, you know, just they, all their friends. So there's that transitoriness, um, there's that isolation, but one of the things that I would say is, I believe that we are in a crisis. One of the crises that they experience most profoundly, for profoundly, is uh, meaninglessness. Um, I think that, uh, and and not just why well, found my own meaning or I found my bliss, I found my purpose, but the greater substantial root kind of meaning that is objective that you can build a life on. Um, that that when all the storms of life attack or when there's isolation, all these other things, all the plans you had are falling through uh, to know that, okay, but this all means something, that this isn't an accident. And I think that a lot of our, our culture and a lot of what they are presented with, or what we're presented with, because we're living in the culture too, is, um, is so temporary and is so based on, in, I'm gonna say this, uh, subjective experience that what happens when that subjective experience is all just pain? What happens when that subjective subjective experience is uh, is is so confusing that I don't understand it? And there's got to be something more. And so I would say that there's the greatest need, the greatest wound is a crisis of meaning because um, it touches every single aspect of their lives. And so if you know someone came to you and just said, "Hey, I, I feel like I'm drowning in meaninglessness." Yeah. Um, uh, desperate for purpose, what would you say is the first step? What is the first step you would encourage them to take? Yeah. Well, the first thing I would, I would, in, in, I want to spell it out and say that you're not an accident, that your life is not an accident, that you're not, you don't have to just happen to exist because that is the presentation. The, the, the idea is uh, of, um, a materialist worldview is that no, you're just a random cosmic. You're 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 stardust. The reason you're special is because you're dust of stars. Like that's not special. If everything's made of stardust, uh, that doesn't mean anything. Um, so to be able to say, okay, one of the things you need to realize is that you're not an accident. That you have been made on purpose. That your life um, has been made for a purpose, and then you get to live on purpose. Uh, but one of the things that happens is you believe your life is an accident. Then we just walk through life. Um, off purpose. We walk through life on accident. And, but if you've been made for a purpose, then you get to live on purpose. And there's even something that's just kind of like to, to, to present a base level of even just that you're not an accident. Uh, you're made on purpose. You actually have the ability to live on purpose is, uh, is an invitation I've seen so many people respond to in a really positive and powerful way. Fantastic. You know, I think a lot of young people, um, they, they suffer, well, people of all ages suffer under the weight of, of shame, mm -hmm. of, of self-loathing, um, of regret. Um, do you have a regret in your life? And how have you made peace with that regret? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, there are some people who say uh, never regret anything in life because it brought you to where you, you are today, it made you per the person you are today. And that is, I mean, I can, I can understand the truth of that, but I don't know that it's completely true in one sense that what if you're a worse person now because of that, that experience? And so um, what if I'm a worse person because of that, because of that experience? So on one hand, that is, there's a truth there, 100%, there's a truth there. But at the same time, um, I think it makes sense to be able to have some 
things that we've lived through, things we've chosen that um, if I had to do it over again, I would have chosen differently. Um, now, here's as Christians, we believe God can use it all. Absolutely. God can use every single mistake we've made, every single sin we've, we, he can, he can write a great story, even in the midst of our brokenness. So I have absolute confidence and faith in that. Um, but I also know that those things, those elements of my life that I've, I wish I hadn't chosen what I get to do now is like, <laughs> this is the, the, what I'll do. And when I feel overwhelmed by that, so you mentioned shame, you mentioned maybe some embarrassment or guilt and that regret. Um, I can't go back in time and change that. What I can do is I can take all of it and place it under his dominion. And I know that's a kind of a fancy way of saying this, but I, I, I surrender it to him and say, okay, God, I can't do anything about this. This is, this is the situation. This is what it, how it happened. These are the consequences that I'm living with right now. And I can't change any of them. So what I'm going to do is I submit them to you. I surrender them to you. And I place them under your lordship. I place it under your dominion. And so you get to be lord of that too. You get to be lord of the my, my broken past. You get to be the lord of the consequences that I'm living through right now that I wish I didn't. I could change if I could, but you get to be lord of it. You get to have access to it. And what I found is I found so much freedom in that um, because there's nothing that he can't do something with. There's nothing, no, no element of our life that God can't do something with. And including the sources of our shame and some of the sources of our guilt. So as you're you're making your journey and and you're you're coming alongside people, ministering to them, um, do you see God using your broken past to minister to those people? Yeah, I even see God using my broken presence to minister to people. Uh, <laughs> there is a, uh, I, I just, you know, um, th there there is an element where. When it's surrendered to him, he uses it all. So here's an example. I, I can talk to my about, about myself, but here's a, someone who's very close to me um, that for years, he's an older man. And for years, he, he we've talked about this. He said, I, I invite people to church all the time, but no one's ever said yes. He's like, what's up with this? Like, I invite people all the time. You say, I need to go out and evangelize. I need to go and invite, welcome people to the church. And no one ever says yes. And uh, I was like, I don't know, <laughs> keep trying, I guess. Uh, this individual at one point had to go to rehab for um, alcoholism and goes to meetings at least once a week, talks with his sponsor at least once a day, um, and is an active part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've seen in this person's life so much where now when he invites people, they respond. Mm. Uh, now when he comes out of this place of uh, before I had places I'm put together. I've got it all under figured it out. I've got it all under control. Um, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go through with you, but now where he comes out of the place of just not excessive, uh, uh, I have my, my badge that says I'm an alcoholic, but out of a place of humility and a place of, uh, I'm approaching others as one who is broken. Uh, people have responded so powerfully to his invitation to come close to the Lord that it's, uh, it's incredible. And I, I see that happen in his life all the time. And I hope it happens in mine too. It's fantastic. You know, we're, we're dealing with sort of epidemic levels of addiction in our culture of all types. What would you say to someone who is struggling with an addiction? I think that um, it all depends on where they're at. As we know that the uh, there's some people who point to ad addiction as an excuse. I, I find that a lot. Then people who say, well, I'm a, I have this addiction, therefore I can't stop this partic particular behavior. And for them, I would have a different word than those who are in denial. Like if for, for someone who's like, I have this addiction, so I don't. Um, it, it's it's kind of like um, any other disease. Think, think of a, um, Think of another kind of mental illness, like say depression or, or something like this. I can't not be depressed. If I am diagnosed with depressed, depression, I can't just not be depressed, but I can continue to take my med medication and I can continue to talk to my therapist and I can continue to show me up for those kind of meetings. So I can't, I can't just eliminate the, the problem, but that doesn't mean I can't, just because I can't do everything doesn't mean I can't do anything. And so that's one thing. So if someone is, is at that place when it comes to addiction and they're saying, I'm just going to uh, blame my behavior on my addiction. Okay. On the other hand, um, there are, there is so much, again, 
go back to the word shame. So much shame when it comes to uh, the wounds that we all carry. And every one of us carries wounds. And some of the ones, some of the wounds that we are most uh, ashamed about, they have the most power over us, are the secret wounds. And sometimes addiction is that. It's just, it's a secret wound for so many people. Um, and so we have to ask the question, um, would it have more power or less power in your life if you brought it out into the light? Mm. Would, it, would, it, would it be easier to carry if you allowed someone else to carry it with you? Um, or would it, would it crush you even more? And I have found so often that people keep themselves back. They hold themselves back from real freedom because they don't want to reach out for help. And I understand that. But um, at the same time, I don't understand it because freedom is possible and, and uh, sobriety is possible and a new life is possible. And I, I just think that um, as long as there are those lies that keep attacking us from inside saying you can't let anyone know um, that no one's there to help, that I tried once and I got shot down, all these kind of pieces uh, to recognize that, that you're not over and your life's not over and freedom uh, can be in your future. That's fantastic. What um, we're talking about, like our aspiration to be all God created us to be. We're talking about our humanity. Um, one thing I notice a lot of people struggle with. I see it a lot in moms, you know. And it's like, okay, you're a mom, but before you're a mom, and before you're a wife, and before you're a daughter, and before you're a sibling you're an individual human being, you know, and, and you have a mandate from God, you know, you have a responsibility to yourself as an individual human being. Um, before you're a priest, before you're a speaker, before you're an author, before you're all of those other things, you're a human being. How do you honor that in the midst of all your other roles and responsibilities? Yeah, that's, um, and not only, I, I, and I would say that my deepest identity would be a child of a son of God, um, that uh, that I can't I can't summarize or express any more deeply, any more central, any more core of of who I am as other than uh, an adopted son of God, and so that has to come first. I know that it's so easy, as you're mentioning, as, as your question even mentions, how how it's so easy to say, well, I've got to get, got to get all this work done. Um, this is this is the task that needs to be accomplished. This is um, the person needs to be taken care of, um, and yet, at the same time, there is a a primary relationship. And the primary primary relationship that gives me me my identity is between the father and myself, and so I would say that um, if when I'm when I'm not, I would say if I'm not, if I if I don't haven't taken the time for prayer, and say okay, let's rephrase accurately when I haven't taken time for prayer. And when I say don't take, take time for prayers is I know that uh, what, what is necessary. I, I know what kind of prayer is necessary. I know how long I need to be in prayer for it to be the kind of prayer that actually goes to the identity and actually helps the relationship. Um, and I also know what kind of prayer it has to be. It can't be prayer where I'm also writing a homily. <laughs> it can't be prayer where I'm also writing, writing a talk. It has to be where it's just, okay, Lord, this is us together. Um, can be brief. But the agenda has to be uh, love, and that, and that, and without that, um, without that, there's, there's, there's nothing else. And, and I think a person could continue to work, but they wouldn't work with. Um, they could keep working, but it wouldn't keep working. Uh, you know, I think that that kind of fuel runs out pretty quickly. Absolutely. You're working with young people. You know, what advice do you have for young people about love? Mm. Um, I can't remember who it was who said this. Uh, Dom Cambera, maybe might have been the name uh, of the man. He said something like, life teaches us how to love. Um, I, I like how in the, in the Christian context, what John Paul II said, which is that the family is the school of love. Um, and so in that case, like life doesn't just teach us how to love. Life could also teach us how to become bitter. <laughs> life could teach us how to resent. Um, but a life lived with Christ teaches, teaches us how to love. And um, one of the things that life with Christ teaches us, one of the aspects of love that life with, with Christ teaches us is that um, you are always free to choose to love. 
Mm -hmm. always free to choose to love. Um, that that there, the gift of the emotion of love is is a gift. It is real and it's a real gift. But I'm not beholden to it, and you don't have to be a slave to that. That you can actually choose to love regardless of your feelings. You actually get to lead your feelings um, when it comes to love, and and that is actually it's actually possible to keep your promises. And that's and that's an element again. Going back to John Paul II, where he said a person who does not promise to love for a lifetime will never truly be able to love truly love for even one day. Mm. Um, because there's that sense that uh, it can't just be transitory. It has to be, and it has to have an element that says, I will, I, 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 when it comes down to this, I always highlight uh, for our couples when I do marriage prep with them, that uh, on your wedding day, you're gonna make some vows, which is kind of silly in some ways, meaning you're gonna make a vow to be faithful to each other, to, to love each other, to honor each other on your wedding day, which, is silly because of course you are that day. Of course, on your wedding day, of course you're gonna love each other, you're gonna be faithful to each other, you're gonna honor each other. The reason you're making a vow on your wedding day is because you know that the day is going to come when you won't feel like loving each other, when you won't want to be faithful to each other, when you don't want to honor each other. And what you're saying is, when that day comes, I promise you, I still will love you and I will still choose you and I will still be faithful to you and I will still honor you. And that kind of thing is something I wish that more people knew because that's possible. It's possible to love like that. So as I listen to you speak, um, you speak about love, you're building uh, your whole description of love and um, story of love and philosophy of love on the idea that love is a choice, but the culture is sending a message very, very powerfully in music, in books, in TV shows, in movies, that love is a feeling. How do you draw people out of the love is a feeling philosophy and into the love is a choice philosophy? Yeah, I think that, um, I think life has to teach them that. And what I mean by like, let's, I think what Dom Canberra was saying, that life teaches us how to love in the sense that um, there are some, relationships that are say even romantic relationships but they also can be relationships of friendship that are only for a season and that's okay so there is there's an element where um just because we're dating doesn't mean that i'm gonna love you forever <laughs> and that's okay just because we're friends in in geometry class doesn't mean that we're friends after school and that's okay that there can be an element of different kinds of friendship there, there's friendships for a season and the friendships for life. There's love for a season that's love for life. To be able to recognize, okay, that's possible. Both things can be true at the same time, that there are such things as kind of more transitional type friendships and relationships, but there's also a great gift that comes along with a permanent or more permanent friendship and a vow to love. And I think that um, oftentimes the young people that I, I deal with, I get to, you know, interact with, one of the things that they're seeing is like, wait a second, wait, wait a second. So I'm dating this person. I mean, we have to, this is forever. Like, well, maybe, <laughs> but hold your horses or the opposite, which is there's no such thing as forever. And so I think that as they mature, the, I don't want to say edges get worn off. What I mean is I think things come into focus where I could recognize there are such things as friendships and relationships, relationships for a season. And there are such things as friendships and relationships for life. And part of the, the wisdom uh, of living is being able to discern which one is which. What is, um, so we're talking about love and there's, there's a youthfulness to love. And, and I think love keeps us young. Yeah. Um, what advice would you have for married couples who've been married for 20, 30, 40 years? Um, well, they haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always think of, of kind of two things. One is, especially if they, well, to be careful with each other. I think that that is one thing that I see happening a lot when it comes to even newly married couples is they um, get to a place where we're so comfortable with each other that we stopped being careful with each other. Um, and I just, and I don't mean fragile way. I don't mean walking on eggshells. 
but I do mean, um, if I've noticed that I'm treating strangers more politely than I'm treating my spouse, something's wrong. If I notice that I'm treating people at work uh, with more care than, than I'm treating my spouse, then something's off. That the, this should be the relationship that I'm being most careful with because this is the one that matters the most and it's the one that's gonna last the longest. Um, so one is just, even just simple, just be careful with each other. Um, second one is um, if someone has revealed themselves to you, stop waiting for them to change. Maybe I'll say it like a different way. Um, I have found that newly married couples are more patient with the foibles and inconsistencies and uh, wounds than well, of their spouse than couples that have been married for a long time, which I think should be the opposite. And on one hand, you might think, well, of course, that by this point, they're just tired of it. And they're just like, I, I don't have any patience for you. But I, I look at that and think, wait, if you've been reminding him to put down the toilet seat for the last 25 years, um, or if you've been, if he's been waiting, you know, it's just like, I'm so frustrated. She's always late. She's always running late when we have to go somewhere. Why would you, why would that, why would you give that permission to stress you out in any way, shape or form? It's been 25 years. If you haven't learned yet, he doesn't put down the toilet seat. She is always late. If you haven't learned that by now, the problem is not with them. The problem is with you at this point. And so I would say that, yeah, I've been married for a long time. Realize this is the person I married and be able to not just accept, but also maybe even delight in those little idiosyncrasies, those little things that's like, of course, yeah, we're going to be late and I'm not going to let it bother me. Or yeah, the seat's this way and I'm not going to let it bother me because if this toilet seat up meant he doesn't actually love me, he would have left me a long time ago. And if and if her being late means she doesn't respect me, then, then this, that's, that, this is the least of my problems. But probably it's just that he is forgetful. Probably it's just that she has a lot on her mind and it happens to, in taking care of everyone else before she takes care of herself. And that's where we're at. And I think there's an element of acceptance of the other person that would bring a lot of peace to couples that have been married for a long time. Excellent insight. So we're, we're talking about relationships and um, a big part of relationships is communication. And I've heard you talk about conversations before. What is the most important part of any conversation? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I would think that on some level, it'd be understanding. Um, meaning I didn't just say what I wanted to say. You understand what I was trying to communicate. But I think that there are so many times in the course of our any given day, or any given situation, where there's not enough time necessarily to clarify. Okay, you said you wanted the blue mittens, not the red ones. They're blue mittens with red stripes. Okay, you know, where yes, that's what I said. Blue mittens, red stripes, both left and right hand, or whatever the thing is. Sometimes there's not enough time to communicate these things in a way that I know you understand me, and you know that I understand you. So the most important part of communication would be, I think what's the, what, what might be the most important part of any relationship, and that is more foundational, I think, than love is respect. And more foundational and respect is built, the love and respect are built off of trust. And, and so that sense of being able to say, oh, I'm sorry, I bought the blue mittens with the red stripe, not the red mittens with the blue stripe or whatever the thing is. But if that person knows they can trust me that person knows they can trust that I respect them and I love them. And if I had remembered, I would have gotten the mittens they wanted, then, then we're going to be okay. Because I know at the end of the day, the most important, part of most important part of communication is the relationship itself. And if that relationship itself is built off of a mutual love and respect undergirded by trust, then, then I think that uh, words are going to be words, but this is the relationship. In, in your book, uh, How to Make Great Decisions, you talk about um, like learning to listen to God, you know, and uh, one of the things I love is how like you make connections between our faith life and the practical realities of our everyday. And so as I'm, I'm listening to you speak, um, you know, about this, this knowing, this understanding, this trusting and I'm, I'm putting that together with the piece in the book about learning to listen to God. 
Um, how does learning to listen to God make us a better listener in relationships? Wow. Yeah. I think on one, I know for myself when it comes to prayer, one of the things that I wanted is I wanted God to speak to me the way it seemed like he spoke to others. Um, here is uh, Samuel, the in, who's in the, living in the temple, and he hears his God calling his voice, Samuel, Samuel, and he goes to Eli and says, you called me, I know I didn't call you. And, and then later on, it's revealed that this is the Lord God calling Samuel. And I'm like, yeah, talk to me like that, Lord. I, I, I don't mind. I'd like to hear the, the audible voice, you telling me what to do. And then realizing that, God, you get to talk to me however you want. Like you actually get to communicate with me how you want, not necessarily how I prefer. And there's something about that that, that is um, a humbling. And also it translates really, really well into our relationships with others. Meaning if I'm gonna expect someone else to think the way I think, I'm going to expect them to do something they can't do. If I'm going to expect someone to always talk the way that or speak the way I speak, then I'm going to be expecting them to do something that they don't have the capacity to do. And so when it comes to the Lord, I want to say, okay, God, speak to me how you, I want to learn how you speak to me. And think when it comes to other people is, is the same thing is, okay, I want to learn how you speak to me, my, my spouse, my friend, uh, my child. Even that's another thing is, is that, you know, for parents and children, that recognition that um, our one's kids are not just carbon copies. You might look similar, but they have their own minds, their own way of, of understanding things, their own way of getting from A to B, their own way of communicating those things. And so there's a massive level of, I get to accept that you have a different mind than I do. You have a different way of speaking than I do. And it's my job to learn how to learn how you speak. And that's what I think we've done with that we strive to do when it comes to the Lord. And then when we do that well, we can realize we're doing, we do it with, we do that with everybody. So we're talking, um, you know, about relationships and every relationship is an opportunity to become a better version of ourselves. Yeah. If you could put together a dinner party and invite a handful of people from history, anyone in history, who would you invite to dinner? That's a great question. And it's one that um, I, it, I think, well, here's one submission, one potential guest list. And I think that I might, the, the, the group that comes to me is, um, one might be the apostles. The other might be a group called the Inklings, right? So C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, uh, Matthew Barfield, I think is another one of them, um, some other folks. And the reason why is because it's a group of friends who had this virtuous friendship. And one of the things that they, they did together is they, um, here's the apostles, they're completely different, but united in their love and experience of Jesus, united in their being commissioned by Christ himself. Uh, the Inklings, same kind of thing, united in their love of literature, but also in their pursuit of the Lord. And that, 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 that to me, um, as an, I'm an introvert, uh, if we have to go to a dinner party, I would like to be at a dinner party where they're all friends and I get to kind of listen in on their conversation. So that's, that's kind of where, where maybe where I would go, but uh, that's just my, yeah, right off the top of my head. Love it. Love it. So let's shift a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the life of Jesus and, and the scriptures. And um, you know, if you could, if you could go into one moment of the life of Jesus, if, if you could have been there for one moment, which moment would you choose? <sighs> wow. Um, I will, <sighs> you know, my, 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 in my mind, I'm going all the way from the big moments. Um, I'll get back to that in a second, but also the small moments where, where it's, um, the day to day with the Lord. So there's the scenes from the gospels that would be incredible. I mean, I think it'd be incredible. On one hand, to be able to be with the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane and to know what that moment means and to be there for Jesus in a unique way, to be able to say, to whatever degree I can, I get it, um, to be able to give him that. On the other hand, uh, it'd be incredible to be able to be there at the moment of the resurrection 
and just to, to bear witness to that incredible reality. And so those are some of the big moments. But again, I just, there's something, so I love going to the Holy Land. I love going to Israel. And one of the things I love about Israel is I love returning to those normal places and just think, okay, the Lord walked here or he saw that hill or this is what uh, the air smelled like when he was walking uh, down Mount Arbel towards the Sea of Galilee. And those elements of just be able to walk with him, to be able to be on that hike with him would be would be remarkable. Um, but sometimes these days, I think I've been there maybe a dozen times or so now, these days, some of my favorite parts of the pilgrimage is when we're just hanging out at the hotel afterwards. And it's it's just this chance to be eating some food, like having a beer and just in, enjoying each other's presence. And so I think some of those moments are the moments I really would love to be able to have with the Lord. Um, the big moments are awesome, but maybe even some of those small moments of just having dinner, um, going for a walk. So um, I love the Holy Land as well. I love, now I love watching other people discover yeah. it for the first time and experience where Jesus walked for the first time and, and walk where Jesus walked. You know, you talked earlier about like this idea of virtuous friendship and a group of, of friends who are challenging and encouraging each other to become the best version of themselves. And um, when you imagine Jesus just walking down the dusty roads with the disciples, what do you imagine that was like? Right. Um, so I have the image is I've had a chance opportunity to hike a bunch in my life or camp a bunch in my life. And one of the things that happens when you're on those kind of journeys um, is you kind of either pair up or you're going to triple up and then drop back and people are joining and rejoining groups. And one of the things that just strikes me is the naturalness of, you know, you just kind of drop back a little bit because you want some quiet time. Are you join up with this other group because you, you, what are they talking about up there? Or you get to just even can walk next to the Lord and have that opportunity to just um, maybe even not even say anything, but be able to be walking with him, walking with him and, and just being in his presence, um, going the same direction, knowing you're headed the same direction. Uh, I keep having that, yeah, that's, that's the, what I keep imagining is those pair ups, those, those uh, dropping back, those walking with the Lord. Um, I imagine it'd be a, a lot, of, whether it be laughter, I imagine that there'd be some times when it was, you know, Jesus set his face like Flint to Jerusalem and he decided I'm going to go there and I'm going to announce to you all that what's going to happen when I get there. Um, it's maybe less laughter in those situations, but, but that would be incredible too, to see how does the Lord face, um, how, how does he do this walk? How does he do this walk where he knows what's at the end of the road? Um, yeah, that'd be, I think it would be pretty remarkable. Awesome. Awesome. If, you know, someone is, you've helped so many people discover the Bible and, and rediscover the Bible. And um, if there's someone listening and watching who has never read the Bible, um, but feels called, feels drawn, um, what one piece of practical advice would you give to someone approaching the Bible for the first time? I, yeah, I, maybe practical advice would be um, let, gosh, if it's a way to say this, let the Bible be what it is and not what you want it to be. Mm. I think that could really help a lot of people. Um, yeah. What about parents? You know, you're you're ministering to young people. They all have parents. Uh, as I've traveled around the world the past decades, I see a lot of anguish in Catholic parents whose children have fallen away from the church. Um, what advice would you have for those parents? Yeah, I think that uh, it's easy to feel powerless because the only person you can control is yourself <laughs> and you can't even control that person very well a lot of times. Um, so it's really easy to feel powerless and yet parents aren't powerless. Um, 
parents not only have the ability to continue to give witness, I mean, and that's a thing, to be able to continue to give witness, even if your children are grown and out of the house, is profound. What I mean by that is, um, say someone has walked away, to always leave a way back. Someone has left, okay, but there's always, I'm leaving this door open, there's always a way back to make that clear. And that is modeling the love of the father. It's loving, it's modeling the, the prodigal father, you know, in the parable. Um, another thing is the power of a, a parent's blessing, the power of a parent's prayer, and the power of a parent's penance. I think that that a willingness to really, you know, Jesus, when there was a, a demon that the, the apostles could not drive out, he said, this one can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. And I think that there is, and there's the evil one, and the evil one wants the souls, he wants our souls, he wants the souls of our, our children, our family, the people we love, and to be able to say, you have these powerful tools, you have uh, the ability to give witness to the Lord, you have ability to keep that door open, you have the ability to pray, you have the ability to um, continue to fast, you have the ability to do penance for, for your kids, and that that is not, uh, those are not some little things, those are not small things, they are powerful things. Mm. As we're talking, almost every topic, what strikes me is um, the celebration of choice, that we do have choice, that we are free to choose. Um, we're making thousands of decisions in our lives. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things I love about your book, How to Make Great Decisions, is that we're just making so many decisions. And, and most people have never thought, okay, what is my process for making a decision? How do I make um, great decisions? How do I give wisdom a place in my decision-making process? Walk us through a little bit, like what is your decision-making process? How do you counsel and, and coach other people to make decisions? Yeah, well, you know, um, Christian Smith, who is a sociologist, he used to be based out of North Carolina, I think Chapel Hill, but now he works at Notre Dame. He had done this nationwide survey on the moral lives of American young adults. And, um, and one of the things he found, he and his team found, was that after researching thousands and thousands of uh, young adults in America, 18 to 29, I think it was, he found the conclusion they came to was that the vast majority, over 66% of American young adults had neither um, the ability nor the categories to make moral de decisions. Mm. And, and what he meant by that was not the ability because he's like, well, we're not the categories. They didn't have the words for it. They didn't have a, the words to, uh, to be able to communicate. Um, this is what good is, this is what bad is. In fact, sometimes the words they would use, instead of saying something was bad, they would say, oh, this is merely stupid. They, you're being stupid, that kind of a thing. Um, so they didn't have the categories of either right or wrong. They also didn't have the categories of um, the act itself, the intention, the circumstances, those kind of things. But then the, the ability uh, to make moral decisions. And he could say that because he said that so often a person would appeal to how they felt. These appeal, appeal to their gut and said, I don't know, I don't know how I chose it. I just, it felt right. I kind of sort of wanted to do it. And so I just based that decision off of a feeling. Now there's such a thing as intuition, obviously, um, but how do you like develop intuition? And so, when it comes to making decisions, whether they be moral decisions or otherwise, um, I think that there's a number of things we can do. And one is we can uh, gather data. And I think that gathering data is one of the most basic things any one of us can do, but um, it's also something we often can overlook. So for example, um, just look at the example of discerning a college to go to um, and say, okay, uh, I don't know, if, should I go to this college or this college, you know, college X or college Y? I don't even know. Well, okay, what are some points of data that you might want to even just discover? Um, well, this college X costs this much, college Y costs this much. Well, I don't know, are there any scholarships? Well, gather data. Um, what, is, what is campus life like? Okay, gather data. And so all those things are just, you're, you're not solving the problem, but you think of it in terms of variables. You have, you're trying to solve for X, but you also have all these unknowns. You have Y and Z and W and all these things. Well, if you can fill in some of those, those letters with actual numbers, with, with data, then you have a better idea at least of how to solve for X. So data gathering. The second is I think counsel. So counsel is very similar to data gathering, but it's not, 
Um, it can be, I mean, you can seek counsel from somebody and get more data that way, but also counsel can often, often help uh, process the data because there's a lot that I don't know. I don't know how to process whether um, college X that costs this much and college Y that costs this much, how that could be offset by scholarships or by whatever, um, but someone else might. So seek counsel from every wise man, as scripture says. Um, so first gathering data, second seeking counsel, a third one is I just think at some point you need to, we need to move, we need to decide. So um, that frightens a lot of people. We need to have courage in order to do that. But why it frightens a lot of people is because if I've decided, that means it's done. That means the decision's over and it, do it doesn't. Um, what it means is I've tentatively taken a step. I've taken a step down this road that looks promising. I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't even know if this is the right step, but if I don't ever take the step, I will never know if that's the right step. And so the image I always have is the image of a sighting in a rifle. So um, in Minnesota and other places in the country where someone goes out to go deer hunting, a couple weeks before you actually go deer hunting, if you have a scope on your rifle, you go to the firing range and you line up the, the target in the scope or in the sights, and then you have to actually pull the trigger. So you line it up and you don't just walk away. Say, oh yeah, it looks like it's good. You have to line it up and then you have to fire and then you see, okay, is it off in any way? Is it, is it down into the left? Is it down into the up and to the right? And if it is, you adjust and then you line it up again and fire again. And, and that is actually how you sight in a rifle. That's actually also how we're supposed to make decisions. We get data, we get counsel, and then we take a, a step and say, is this the right step? And if it's not, then we calibrate and take another step. And if calibrate and take another step, that's not failure, that's the process. And that's how it's supposed to go. It's not, I made this decision and now I just don't have to think about it anymore. It's made the decision to take one step, not to run the whole marathon. So when you're, you're making a decision, you know, sometimes it's hard enough to make a decision with even if you have a rich inner life, even if you're sort of, you feel like you're in a great place in your spiritual life, it seems for a lot of people, however, even people who are committed to the spiritual journey, that making a difficult decision also coincides with a difficult time of prayer, a time mm -hmm. when they're struggling to pray, when they're having trouble praying. When you're having trouble praying, how do you recalibrate? How do you, how do you allow God to draw you back into it? How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one one big piece is consistency. One big, it's faithfulness. Um, that I would say that, hands down, consistency beats intensity every time. That recognition of I'm going to show up again, and uh, whether prayer is is uh, full of consolation or whether it's full of difficulty, dryness, distractions, um, that's that's okay. It doesn't matter because I'm here. Secondly, I'm I'll be back tomorrow. That that sense of um, when it comes down to it, everything's not riding on this one prayer time. This is, and also, gosh, I mean, if I'm only seeking an answer when I go to prayer, um, I will often leave disappointed. Mm. But if I seek the Lord when I enter into prayer, then I'll never be disappointed. And, and so I think that it also, speaking of recalibration, it recalibrates our focus. Because sometimes I will, I'll go into prayer like, okay, no, Lord, here we go. We got to figure this out. And he reminds me, I figured it out already. Uh, what this time is for is for you to get to know my heart. Because he already knows my heart. But that time of prayer is for me to get to know his heart and to abide in him, to rest in him, um, and to find him there, yeah. So you keep showing up. And um, when you keep showing up, that takes the urgency out of it. You're not, yeah. you know, yeah. showing up and saying, all right, God, do your thing. Um, <laughs> go, go. <laughs> how, how, how have you grown into that patience yeah. um, over the last 30 years? Oh, man. I um, could, because, you know, ever since that first moment of conversion and up until, ordination every day every day the prayer was god just tell me just tell me what it is you want me to do do you want me to be a priest do you want me to marry this girl do you want whatever just, just and i remember thinking i would even say in my prayer just tell me i i don't care what it is i mean i do care what it is but if you tell me i'll do it and god is so good because he will never be too late with 
his revealing his invitation to us, but he will also never be too early with his revealing his invitation to us. And I know this looking back now that every, I mean, I, there are so many graces that I missed um, that God was giving me. Cause I would go every retreat I went to every, every um, camp I went to every uh, time of prayer, every mass, I wanted my one answer. That's mm. all I wanted. And here's God who's trying to give all these other graces. But I'm like, no, 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 I don't want those other graces. I want the answer. And I think of how ungrateful that I, I must have been during that whole time because he was moving, he was acting, he was doing something in my life, but I was only paying attention, paying attention to what I hadn't been given yet. And I wasn't paying attention to what he was giving me. And so that's a, that, was, that was a deep conviction that um, it took me a while to, to understand and to really not just understand, but also recognize for what it, what it is, like how, how, how deep that goes. Um, here's God constantly blessing, but no, until you give me the thing I'm asking for, I don't want any of those other blessings. That's one thing. That's one th big thing that taught me. Um, the other is, I remember that when the Lord finally made it very clear that he was inviting me to even just go to seminary. Um, it was painful because I was, I had been dating this girl for about three years and I knew what had to happen in that relationship. But so it was, it was, it was very difficult but he had prepared my heart sufficiently so that by that moment, I was able to say yes in freedom. And I would think that I, I, I've often looked back and, and have I've wondered if the Lord had even revealed that two weeks earlier, if my heart would have been in the right place, mm. if it would have been in the same place. I might have still done what he asked, but it might have been more like trying to fit around peg in a square hole. Um, so that recognition of in the meantime, God is giving so many blessings. Secondly, uh, is that he's on time. He's never going to be too late, but he also won't, will not be too early. So you went, you went to seminary. Um, how is priesthood different to how you thought it would be as a seminarian? <laughs> I think I emphasized in my mind, uh, in anticipation, I emphasized all the potential negative things that possibly could be, you know, full, full. I, I, I honestly, I pictured the life of a priest in Northern Minnesota to I, me, myself in my own, by myself, uh, drafty rectory with the winter winds rattling the, the windows and me sitting in a rocking chair, you know, with an Afghan on my lap, stro stroking my cat while I looked out over the desolate barren wasteland of, you know, the winter of Minnesota. Um, I thought that would be a lot of, a lot of that. And I would say, and I also thought, um, I was afraid of being, a, being lonely, um, I don't think I'm afraid of being alone, but I'm afraid of being lonely. And I would say that the both of those both of those fears were were inaccurate. They're misplaced fears uh, that I've never <laughs> I haven't been lonely more than 15 minutes. I think in the last 18 years of being ordained, um, yeah, it's been such a gift. My life has been so full of joy and so full of the Lord, so full of like incredible people. Um, the problem is that I don't have enough life to uh, fit all the people in. You know, I don't, I don't have enough um, uh, it, capacity for all of the, the gifts that God has, has been giving. And so again, the fear was, was loneliness. The fear was like isolation and sadness. Um, and uh, the reality has been the opposite. Even though I know that at some point the Lord, I mean, he has to purify my heart somehow. So he does it in a number of ways. One of those ways could be in the future of leading me into a place of loneliness, which by that point, I pray that um, I'll be able to see it as a gift from his hand, that sense of like, no, maybe there's loneliness, maybe there's pain, but this is because he's, he's good and he wants me to be his fully. It's beautiful. So you talk about these sort of different seasons in your yeah. life, different seasons in our lives. What advice would you have for someone who hasn't been to confession for a while? Well, I would, my advice is always go. <laughs> I mean, without hesitation, go. There was a, uh, a person who contacted me and said, I haven't been to confession in 50 plus years. Um, can I go to confession? And it was the most incredible thing. Um, when she left, she was walking out of the out of the confessional. She said, "You're going to need to call me tomorrow to make sure I'm not dead." And I remember thinking, um, 
what does that mean? <laughs> and so I contacted her the next day and said, Hey, I hope you're still alive. You know, I don't, I don't know if this is a joke or this is a whatever. Um, this is a threat, you know, wait, she's safe and not place of safety. And she, she wrote to me in an email. She said, I'm afraid that you thought that I was going to hurt myself. I would never hurt myself. I meant call me tomorrow to make sure that I'm not haven't that I haven't died of joy. Um, she says that the her entire she said I can't believe it was 50 years I just let these small things hold me back mm. allowing the Lord to forgive me allowing me to enter into joy allowing me to enter into the love and the life that God has for me because I thought well I'm disqualified I can't say this I I mean I can't reveal this to anybody I can't whatever the thing is and I realized that for so much of her life she has refused to enter into joy and I'm just so yeah so uh make sure I'm not dead tomorrow because of joy. And uh, yeah, she's written many times since then, just saying like every day, every day is a gift. Um, and that could be you. So if someone has been away from confession for a long time, uh, why, why, why not enter into joy? When I put down what is weighing you down and uh, allow the Lord to love you as you are. Powerful. I think very often we make the assumption that people know Jesus um, let's imagine we're in a place and a time where uh, people have never heard of Jesus. Um, and in some ways, that's not unlike this place and time for many people. Yeah. How would you describe Jesus to someone who has never heard of him? Yeah. I, one thing I would want to do is want to find out what they do know or what they do imagine. Like, is, is there, a, do you have an awareness that there's more to this life than just this life. Do you have an awareness that there's there's more, that you're not an accident, but you're made on purpose? Is there any awareness of that? Um, do, you have a, do, you have, do you have a hope or even a, a, a glimmer of a hope that your life is intentional, that it means something, that your choices mean something, that there is someone behind it all or something behind it all? So I'd, I wanna find out if that's the case. And it, if, if it is the case, there's that sense of being able to say, okay, then let's 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 talk about your heart, and let's talk about your experience of life, because my guess is your experience of life and your heart has been this: that uh, you have longing in your heart that um, you wonder if it's you wonder if it's real. You wonder if um, the longing in your heart is can never be ever be really satisfied or if you just wishful thinking because you thought it was uh when i get the degree then i'll be happy and you got the degree and you weren't happy you thought it was well yeah but a person i just want someone who loves me you when you had that relationship with that person you, and uh, then i'll be happy and you, and you got it and you weren't completely happy well maybe i have to have kids maybe if i have this job maybe if i live in this place maybe if i collect a bunch of experiences and to be able to say okay there's all these pieces that you thought we're going to make you happy. And so now maybe there's some bitterness. Maybe there is some disappointment. Maybe even there's some anger at um, being sold this lie that if you did these things, accomplished these things, got these things, then you'd be happy. Um, I just want to let you know that all of that was a lie. Now, I'm not saying that people who told you that were liars. Maybe they didn't know any better. But at least you know this one thing. It wasn't true. But... There is one, uh, the one behind everything, the one who made this universe, the one who made it good, the one who made that heart in you that you say, but I think something in my heart is made for love. I think this thing in my chest is made for more. That one who made that heart actually made you for more and that more is him. Mm. And, 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 and that sense of being able to say that he revealed his heart and his heart is one that says this. Um, I don't know if you know this, but you know there are a lot of religions around the world um, and every one of them, you have to fight to get the God or the goddess's attention. You have to work to get them to notice you. And um, you have to bleed in order for them to pay attention to you or to care about you. But in this broken world, the one God who made everything, he made it good and he made your heart. He didn't break your heart, but he made your heart. And then this world and sin broke your heart. Um, he entered into this world and he allowed his heart to be broken. So you would know that you have a God who has a broken heart like yours, that he allowed himself to bleed, not because, not so 
you didn't have to bleed to get his attention. He came down to this earth and he became one of us and he bled to get your attention. Um, you don't have to give him the, this massive sacrifice so that uh, he, he can trust you, that he gave everything so that you would trust him. And that's what his heart is and that's who he is. That's fantastic, very powerful, very beautiful. There's a lot of people out there have read your books, they've listened to you speak, um, you've been an inspiration to them, they admire you. Um, they think they know you, they know parts of you. Right. What's one thing you would like all of those people to know about you as a human being? Yeah. Uh, on the surface, I would say, know that I'm an introvert. <laughs> and so I get, I like people, I get recharged by being alone. Um, but that's not something that I think uh, matters really in the big picture of, of things. I think uh, what, if you I think it's, it's good for all of us to be reminded of and good thing for people uh, to be reminded about myself is that just um, everyone has, uh, everyone is wounded. And everyone, and I guess, as we said before, uh, some of the most shameful wounds we have are the ones that are secret, the ones that no one else sees. And they don't have to be scandalous. They could just be that they're that thorn in our side, right? They don't have to be something that would break, shake someone's faith, but every one of us is wounded, right? And so um, I'm not an exception to that. Uh, I'm not an exception to the rule of humanity, which is we are all walking wounded. Um, but I also recognize that the Lord Jesus loves me in my woundedness and he continues to call me in my woundedness and he continues to use me in my woundedness. And, uh, and so uh, what I would want people to know is uh, the level of woundedness and my need for prayers. Excellent. So last two questions, one very worldly question, one very otherworldly question. We live in a material world. God has gifted us with this material world. What is one material possession that just brings you great joy? You know, it's just a thing. You understand it's just a thing, but it just brings you great joy. Wow. Uh, that's a great question because I've actually thought about this recently. Um, I, 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 about a year and a half ago, I got my first buck, um, my first year, but I got it by hitting it with my car. Um, so, it, so it totaled the car and so I had to get a new car. And almost every, it's been a year and a half almost, and virtually every time I get in the car and start it, I think this is such an awesome car. <laughs> I, when I drive it, I think this is great. It's the same the brand as all my other cars basically before this, um, but it's just a new model. And I just think this is so nice. I love it so much. So my car. That's awesome. When we turn to the other worldly, you know, I think we don't talk enough about heaven. We don't think enough about heaven. When you reflect on heaven, what do you think about? What do you imagine? What comes to mind? I think you're right. I think we don't think enough about heaven. And yet this is, this is God willing, our destination. This is God willing where we get to spend eternity. And I think many of us are, uh, we want heaven because we don't want the other thing, but we don't want heaven for what heaven really is. Uh, and, and that recognition of, uh, not only on the one hand, we have, as scripture says, a new heavens and a new earth where all creation gets redeemed. All creation is groaning as awaits redemption. Um, so that means that this universe will be a redeemed universe. So heaven's not simply spiritual. It's actually tangible, physical, material, but supernaturalized material world. So this completely redeemed and also at our bodies, completely redeemed, resurrected bodies that have all the properties that God originally intended and more when it comes to Jesus Christ as the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. Um, not only that, but relationships redeemed. I mean, just all these pieces, the creation redeemed, our bodies redeemed, relationships redeemed. Um, and then the, the heart of heaven, which is God himself. And that sense of being able to say, man, I, I know my heart isn't prepared for heaven because of the fact that uh, I, I know my heart needs to be more open to the Lord than it is. And right now heaven can't fit in my heart or my, maybe I'll say that my heart can't fit into heaven yet. And so every time I go to prayer, that's, that's one of the things I'm asking God to do is God, um, let me love you 
so much that if all you ever gifted me in heaven was you, that would be enough. And so that's, that's the heart of my prayers is God, let me love you so much that if all you ever gifted me in heaven was you, then that would be more than enough. It's beautiful. Amazing to be with you. Same, love having same. this conversation. Hope we can do it again soon. Um, God bless you. Thank you for all you're doing for the church. I know that um, it comes at a cost to you personally. And on behalf of everyone um, who has been touched by your life and your ministry, just thank you for, for who you are. That means a lot. Thank you, Matthew. I really, that means a lot. And I, I want to thank you too, because I even actually uh, have a, a homily coming up where I'm quoting you a bit. So I'm grateful for all that you've done and all that I've learned from you. God bless you. We we'll hope you have a great day and look forward to chatting with you again soon. Thanks. Same. God bless. God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye.